This is a Darmanet presentation. Okay, so for, for this evening's uh, Dhamma talk, we already were talking a little bit about uh, uh, some historical uh, questions. So I thought maybe we could uh, kind of continue that, but also kind of look at uh, uh, the role of history in Buddhism and why, why Buddhists are concerned with their history and uh, what it means. So you know, history is an interesting uh, topic because obviously in, in Buddhism, uh, Buddhism, at least in theory, is all about the present. Right, so you should always be in the present moment and all letting go of the past and so on. But Buddhists are, are constantly concerned about the past, aren't we? Yeah, ancient monuments and legends and the Buddha. He lived a long time ago. Why don't we just forget about him? Right, because the Buddha's not today. Yeah, surely there, surely there are people alive today who are much more intelligent and and uh, articulate and advanced and evolved than the Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> but so as Buddhists, we, we we always talk about being in the present, but we spend a lot of time being in the past. And I mean, I'm I'm certainly no exception to that. I I find history a fascinating topic, and to study the evolution of the Dhamma and its place in history and so on, I find to be very interesting. One of the reasons why history is interesting, especially for me, is because it helps us to give us some kind of sense of context of the time and place where the Buddha uh, lived, uh, because otherwise the Buddha's teachings can be a little bit abstract. Right? So uh, if we know who was it that the Buddha was speaking to, uh, what kind of people were they, what were their concerns, what were their fears, what were their desires, what did they... What, did they, what were they conditioned by? What were they aspiring for? And then we have some more idea of what the Buddha was uh, talking about, why he taught in those particular ways, why he used particular language, why he used particular concepts, and why he didn't use other kinds of language and concepts that we might find more familiar. So uh, I might talk a little bit about the history of the Buddha and you know the times that he lived in and uh, what we know about that, what we don't know, and uh, how that affects our understanding of the Dhamma. So one of the things that is important when we look at history is uh, how do we know? I mean, if I asked uh, anybody here what was, the, what was the first thing that I said in this Dhamma talk, okay, <laughs> we're already thinking, hang on, uh, what was, how do we start? Uh, right? It was only a couple of minutes ago. So how can, we, how can we talk reliably about things that happened uh, two and a half thousand years ago? Right? So this is something that's not at all obvious and is very, you know, among uh, scholars of uh, all kinds of history and including Buddhist history, there's a lot of discussion and disagreement about these particular points. Now, uh, if we look in, in the Buddha's teachings, uh, both in the early Buddhist teachings and also in the Buddhist traditions, we find that they, they always talk about Two, uh, two aspects of knowing, or two things that are helpful for being able to know something. Okay. Uh, the first thing is direct experience. Okay. The second one is inference. Two things: direct experience and inference. The other thing that's important about the Buddhist uh, uh, attitude to knowing, or to, to how do we know things, is it that knowledge in Buddhism is always pragmatic. Okay, it, that is to say that we're not Buddhism is not a search for some kind of ultimate or absolute truth. The search for Buddhism is a search for the ending of suffering. Okay, so it doesn't really matter what kind of truth it is, as long as you can let go of suffering. That's all that matters. Right? So it's it's a functional uh, theory of truth or approach to truth. So we take the bear these principles in mind when we begin to look at Buddhist history. So we bear in two things: the the uh, direct experience. And the inference, and we we do this. We use this in for a pragmatic purpose. A pragmatic purpose is not so that we can get some final, absolute, definitive answers to who was the Buddha. Or, you know, what did he teach? All of these questions, right? Because of course, the Buddha was different to different people. 
right? I mean, even even for you and I, we're, we're different to different people. We mean different things to different people. And of course, the Buddha was like that. There's no final definitive answer to that. And there's no final definitive answer to the question, you know, what did the Buddha teach? Obviously, he taught different things at different times to different people. So there'll always be a, a room for a subjective and in interpretive approach to those things. The important thing is, what is useful, what is what is helpful to overcome suffering. Okay. Now, remember these two aspects of truth, the direct evidence and the inference. Now, in terms of direct evidence in the time of the Buddha, uh, we look to things like, say, archaeology. Right? Even archaeology is not that direct, but it's reasonably direct evidence. And what, what does the archaeology tell us about the times of the Buddha? Okay. The answer to that is, unfortunately, not very much. Okay, but the best archaeology we have, the most the most uh, useful and meaningful and certain facts that we have are the edicts of King Ashoka. Okay, you have these all across India. You have these big pillars and inscriptions in rock that record, in a very archaic and primitive form of Indian writing, the most primitive form of Indian writing that we have, in fact. Uh, the extensive edicts of King Ashoka right across the whole of India. Uh, and so you have quite an extensive corpus because it's, in, it's either carved in, in rocks which are in place, in situ, or else in massive pillars which are very hard to move. Then we can, it's, we're pretty sure that this is where these things belong, right? You can't pick it up and put it somewhere else. Yeah? And because of the writing style and references to uh, Greek and even Egyptian uh, rulers and things at that time, we're able to fix uh, King Ashoka fairly precisely in historical time, around 250 uh, BC. So roughly 150 to 200 years after the Buddha, most probably. So uh, the edicts of King Ashoka don't tell us all that much about uh, the Buddha and his life, but they do tell us some things. Uh, probably the most clear fact that we get from the Ashokan pillars is the uh, pillar in Lumbini, which uh, says that this is where the Buddha was born. Okay, so you have a, you have a big stone pillar written, uh, uh, created about 200 years or so after the Buddha, and it says in, as in literally says, this is where the Buddha was born, Iha Buddha Jate, yeah, twice it says that. So it doesn't get any better than that, right? <laughs> That's in terms of historical evidence. That's that's the gold standard. Yeah. And so the other, uh, last year, I had somebody rang me up in Bodhinyana. Said he wanted to talk to me. He had this urgent uh, uh, historical finding. He said he said he, he discovered that the Buddha wasn't really born in Lumbini. He was born somewhere else. You know, from time to time, you find people with these kinds of of theories. And he wanted to. He was so enthusiastic. And I, I'm I'm afraid I kind of disappointed him a lot. I just sort of cut him off and said, look, it's impossible. Okay. The, the evidence that the Buddha was born in Lubini is the best possible kind of historical evidence. There simply doesn't exist anything which is better than that. And so to argue based on anything, on any texts or any archaeological finds or anything you like, that the Buddha was born somewhere else is just doomed from the beginning because there simply isn't any better evidence. Uh, Sometimes you just, have to, you just have to take a stand on these things. Otherwise, you know, when it comes to things like the life of the Buddha and so on, it can be, it becomes very speculative, and it can people, everyone likes to read their own things in there. So it's much better to 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 keep some kind of grounding with what what is the actual history. So that brings us to you know we've got a place, we've got a time, not long after the Buddha. What about in the time of the Buddha himself? Well, we don't have any really. Uh, solid evidence for the life of the Buddha in terms of the archaeology. Um, it seems that in the time of the Buddha that that was just a, a beginning phases of urbanization in India. So there weren't like any really developed cities. Uh, buildings were made of wood, uh, so things were largely perishable. Uh, you know, there were the first cities were being built and so on, but they were still fairly small. Not long afterwards, in the time of uh, Ashoka, in the time of uh, uh, the, the Nanda Empire and the later the Mauryan Empire, of course, Pataliputta became a vast capital. Uh, and you know, even from the Greek writings of Megasthenes, uh, gives some idea of this is a huge metropolis by that time, and that's only a hundred years after the Buddha. And so the India changed drastically. The, the cultural scene in India went underwent was undergoing a 
complete and radical revolution from the time of the Buddha until the time of the Nandas, really, about 50 years afterwards. All of the, the, the nations, the countries that the Buddha walked through, uh, he gave a list in the suttas of the, the 16 great nations. And, you know, they're called 16 Mahajanapadas, which gives you a, a sense. At the time, they thought this was a great nation. You know, in fact, it's, it's about the size of half of a state in current India, right? But for them, that was a great nation. And the kings were great kings and the capitals were great capitals. But they haven't even left a single trace or almost not a single trace in the archaeological record. Within 50 years after the Buddha died, that scene had completely changed. The whole of India from uh, northwest of, of Delhi uh, on the western side through to Kalinga on the, uh, on the southeast uh, uh, coast was unified under the Nanda Empire. And we know this again, from, we have very strong evidence that this was the case. Huh? And because we have in, in Kalinga, we have an inscription that refers back to the rule of uh, the Nandas and said that they built irrigation there. Right? So not only did they conquer it, but they actually did capital works there. So we know that. At the same time, uh, when Alexander invaded India from the northwest, he came through Pakistan and they very famously heard the rumors of the army of the Nanda emperors. And uh, Alexander's army rebelled against him and wouldn't cross the river, wouldn't go into India, even just having heard about their, their, their herds of war elephants and, and other things. So, uh, so there's a vast emperor, empire. Within just a few decades of the Buddha passing away, this had happened. Yeah, so it's very, very interesting, this, this, this very rapid shift. So from that period onwards, we have that you know, strong, concrete evidence of cities and capital works and things like that, inscriptions. But from the time of the Buddha, we have very little. The main evidence from the time of the Buddha is something which is very simple and very humble, and that's a kind of pottery they call Northern Black Polished Ware, NBPW, they usually abbreviate it. And it's a distinctive kind of pottery, like they can identify in the archaeological strata. Earlier there was another one they call Painted Grey Ware, and then they developed this black, Northern Black Polished Ware. What that signifies is it was more control of fire. Yeah. You think about that, yeah? It's not just pottery, it means that they could fire kilns to a much higher degree. Yeah? At the same time, iron was developed in India, right? So both of those requiring a lot of heat, a lot of energy, and so both of them signifying that this advance in the technology of the use of fire. And that happened around the time of the Buddha, maybe a little bit earlier. And through that whole area, the main thing that you find characteristic, you find, you find iron smelters, the, the remnants of them, but you find the fragments of pottery, the northern black polished ware, and you find that all, all the way around in the areas of, the Bud of India where the Buddha uh, was, was said to travel uh, in the suttas. So all the area around uh, Rajagaha, modern-day Bihar, uh, to Savati, uh, Vesali and and uh, and so on, all the areas that we hear the Buddha traveling around again and again in the sutta. So that whole area is characterized by the northern black polished ware. And I was talking about this with some of the monks last year, and we were we were saying, how come, it, how come this northern black polished ware is what we find from the the culture at the time, but we don't find any mention of it in the suttas, right? We, we were looking, we, thought, we look up in the suttas for, for, for northern black polished ware, and we're trying to think, where is it? And we couldn't find any references to it. I thought, that's strange. And then all of a sudden, one day, I realized, hang on, you eat out of it every day. <laughs> that's what the monk's bowls is, is northern black polished ware, actually. In the veneer, it says there are two materials which you can make your bowls out of, right? One of them is iron, and the other is pottery clay. Yeah? And that's precisely those two materials which, whose technology is characteristic of that period, yeah? iron and the northern black polished ware. In fact, I was told later that there actually is a, 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 a remnant of an ancient Buddhist monk's bowl in a museum in India. I've never seen it, but it is in fact out of northern black polished ware. So that's what, when you see the black shiny color of the monk's bowls, that's where that comes from, is the northern black polished ware. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah, we've been using it for such a long time. So, so this was that uh, uh, culture of, of that, that, that period and that, that time and that place. So uh, 
so we're getting this kind of feeling for a, 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 a culture which is in a rapid period of, of change. Yeah? One of the, I guess, um, one of the myths or one of the uh, stories that we, we, we often tend to believe about the past is that the past was static. Yeah? We, we, we tend to, to project into the past that everything was always the same. And uh, obviously, you know, our current times is, is changing much more rapidly, right? So we, we find much more rapid change today in the past, fair enough. But still, things weren't the same all the time. And in particular, when it comes to ancient India, uh, we often sort of have this idea in the back of our minds that ancient India was Hindu, right? Is that right? Yeah. Was it, were Indians Hindus? No? Deepika knows better because she's heard me give Dhamma talks. <laughs> right? So we have this idea that Hinduism's always been there, right? And the Buddha was a Hindu. Right? Is that right? Ah, that's what many people think. But things are always changing. That's actually not, not true at all. To say that the that, that the Buddha was Hindu or that Indians even were Hindu in the time of the Buddha is completely anachronistic. And in fact, it's like saying that Moses was a Catholic, right? Yeah, Moses wasn't. Yeah, was Moses a Catholic? No. Moses belonged to a religious tradition, right, which evolved and changed and transformed and became Catholicism, and which is a part of that thing. So yes, obviously there are religious traditions which are part of what we call Hinduism. Right? They're not disconnected, but what we understand of as Hinduism today didn't even remotely exist in the time of the Buddha. Yeah? Uh, so if you, you know, if you, even if you look at specific uh, examples of things, like, for example, if, you know, say the worship in temples, right? There was no temples. Yeah? Worship of uh, Krishna, not heard of. Shiva, not heard of. Vishnu, not heard of. Ganesh, not heard of. Uh, Rama, not heard of. Uh, and so on. So all of these, these uh, uh, major gods in Hinduism are either completely unknown or else maybe they're, they're mentioned as minor deities once or twice here and there, but they're certainly not um, well, it's kind of the dominant you know, focus of worship uh, that they are today in contemporary Hinduism. What you did have in the time of the Buddha, you had the, the Vedas, which had their, uh, uh, their different religious teachings. You had the Vedic rituals based on those. You had the Brahmins, who were the bearers of the Vedas and so on. So that's obviously an important strand uh, of the tradition which became Hinduism. You also find uh, various uh, sort of local worship cults. This is very, very common, like Yakas and Nagas and so on. Each village and each town, they would worship their local Yakas and their local Nagas and things like that. Now today, if we were to go to India, we, we think of that as part of Hinduism, right? In fact, it's completely different, right? There, there, there's no historical relationship between those things whatsoever, right? The, the Vedic religion was something which was brought to India uh, by the Aryan peoples, right? When they came there, they found people who were already worshipping these Yakas and Nagas and so on. They're actually quite different religious strands. Right? And so one of the accomplishments of the uh, great Hindu uh, scholars of the Middle Ages, Shankara and others, was to unify all of those different religious traditions so that all of those local strands, the different philosophical traditions, the, the contemplative traditions, the Vedic ritual traditions, and so on, all of those different strands, which actually were quite separate, and they weren't seen as being part of the same thing. They were all brought within one umbrella. Yeah? And that synthesis happened around 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th centuries. That's the thousand years after the Buddha. And it's that synthesis which we call Hinduism. Right? And that synthesis didn't exist in the time of the Buddha, even though many of the elements, not all of the elements, but many of those elements did exist. Yeah? But they were, they were quite separate things. So these, if, you know, if you hear somebody saying you know, the Buddha was a, a Hindu, then you know, this is just anachronistic. It's, it's, obviously, in one sense, you know, the Buddha's uh, family uh, would have been you know, practicing the local uh, religious rites, we assume, right? We assume that in Kapilavatu, like anywhere else, they probably had their local spirits who they'd uh, do maybe ceremonies for the harvest and so on and so forth. Uh, and we assume that his family and that young Siddhartha participated in those things and so on. Uh, 
Um, but this is more to do with just a kind of the, the uh, relationship with the spirits and the relationship with nature and so on and so forth. It's not really to do with being a, a Hindu in that kind of sense. So, so this, is a, this, is a, this actually is one of the things which was um, uh, already uh, discovered and made very clear in the late 19th century. Actually, when, when, when in, in the modern era, when we first started to trace back the history of Buddhism, uh, the first people that the history of Buddhism was learned from, or history of India was learned from, was from the Brahman Pandits. When, they, when the British were in India, they, they studied the, the Hindu Puranas and the Brahman Pandits. And that's the Brahman Pandits said, oh, Hindu, India has always been Hindu. And this kind of idea got into the mainstream and it's been very persistent ever since then. Uh, but it didn't take long for until people like uh, Thomas Rhys Davids and others who uh, read the Pali texts, they read the things like the Mahavangsa and so on. They began to do the archaeology. Cunningham discovered all the ancient Buddhist sites. They began to realize, hang on, if this is a, uh, uh, if, if, if India has always been a Hindu country, how come for hundreds of years in the archaeological record, nearly a millennium in fact, in the archaeological record, we find nothing of Hinduism and plenty of things of Buddhism and Jainism. Okay, it's also something just to bear in mind. At the time of Ashoka, all of the hundreds of years, there's, there's nothing uh, to meant to, of Hinduism. Gradually, they start to appear, but still, the, the majority of uh, archaeological findings in India, for maybe a, probably I guess a thousand years after the Buddha, the majority of things are all Buddhist. Yeah? And then gradually, Buddhism started to decline, and the Hinduism started to get more popular. So. India, like anywhere else, was shifting and changing. So there are different strands and so on. So uh, when, when we're uh, looking at, at, at the Buddha and trying to understand his teachings, then of course it's very important to understand who is he teaching for. Now this, this is not something which is purely an abstract idea. Right? For example, this has, this has real um, implications in terms of how people understand Buddhism. And just as one example of that is a common argument which you'll hear is that uh, the Buddha taught rebirth, right? Because that's what everyone believed. Yeah, everyone believed in rebirth, right? So the Buddha just adopted this Hindu idea and taught this Hindu idea of rebirth, right? This is what some people will argue. Now, if you know the historical situation, you know that, well, that's a bit silly, right? It wasn't Hindu for a start. In fact, the culture at the time of the Buddha was extremely diverse. And this is one of the things that we learn from looking at the early suttas. Huh? There's, there's, there's so much diversity both within the Brahmanical tradition and also outside of the Brahmanical tradition. I mean, the, the, the Brahmanical tradition, which evolved into what we call Hinduism, was very, very far from being some kind of unified, rigid, dogmatic system, right? I mean, Hinduism has never been like that. It was, it was, it was very questioning. Uh, there, were, there were all kinds of different uh, takes on things, all kinds of different interpretations, and all kinds of different ways of relating, even within the Brahmanical tradition. And we find this, this, this questioning spirit, both within the Buddhist texts, we also find it within the Brahmanical scriptures at the same time, within the Upanishads, the same kind of thing. People asking, questioning, what their tradition was, what the meaning of these rituals were, what the role of these scriptures were, what's the role of uh, experience. <coughs> Not only was that questioning going on within the Brahmanical tradition, it was also going on in the other uh, non-Brahmanical traditions, what we call the Shramana traditions in, in ancient India. Uh, and the Buddha, of course, counted himself among the Shramana traditions. And the... the, the, the um, the defining point of that being that they didn't hold allegiance to the Vedic tradition and the Brahmanical tradition, um, but the Shramana traditions based themselves on the experience of, of direct vision of the truth. So within the Shramana um, uh, movement, of course, uh, again, a lot of diversity in the time of the Buddha, but of those movements, only Buddhism and Jainism have lasted to the present day. All of the other Shramana movements have, have passed away, although some of them lasted for a long time in India. There's evidence of the Ajivika tradition for, I think, about 1,500 years or so in India. So they weren't um, minor movements by any means. Uh, 
So these, so the Buddha positioning himself as a shramana movement, that is positioning himself outside of the Vedic and Brahmanical mainstream, quest, as a questioning, right? As as a as a uh, uh, um, as an iconoclast, right? He's he, he rejecting the tradi- the rituals, rejecting the authority of the Vedas, and uh, proposing a, a radical new way of seeing the truth and a way of living. So, like I said, we can't um, uh, we can't uh, situate the Buddha too uh, too firmly in time in, in this in the, through the archaeological record. Right? We only have those few scraps of things from the, the northern black polished ware and a few other bits and pieces from the time of the Buddha, but nothing really substantial. Uh, one of the interesting pieces of archaeology, which has just come to light in recent years, is a finds at a place called Deokota, uh, Deokota. And this is, Deokota is a, uh, uh, a almost unknown site in ancient India, which was discovered in 1984 by some archaeologists, right? And they discovered it purely randomly. They, they said, well, look, there's some Buddhist sites over here, and there's some Buddhist sites over there, and it seems that the Buddhists were traveling along from there to there, so there's probably something in between them. So they went there and had a look around and asked the villagers, oh, are there any ancient sites here? And they said, oh, yeah, there's one over there. So they went and saw it. And it's actually quite a major site. It's lots of stupas, dozens of rock-cut caves, paintings, and inscriptions. Yeah? So it gives you an indication of how many things are still undiscovered. But one of the things which they found at the site of Diokota is the oldest lineage list. It's actually very interesting. It's, you know, it's, a, it's a rock inscription in Brahmi characters from about the time of Ashoka, maybe a little bit later. It seems that the Diokata site may be somewhat pre-Ashokan, but the inscription is maybe a little bit later than that. Uh, but the inscription traces back a lineage of teachers. There are two inscriptions. They both trace back a lineage of teachers back to the Buddha himself through about nine or twelve generations of teachers. There's a bit of uncertainty because the inscriptions aren't um, preserved 100%. But as far as we can tell, there's about 9 or 12 uh, steps in the lineage of teachers back to the Buddha. Right? So that's not all that much, is it? Yeah. So if you estimate maybe 20 years yeah, uh, for each generation of teacher and student, something like that. Uh, so roughly about 200 years or so between this inscription and the time of the Buddha. And is is in the is in the old area, even though it's not a site that's known from the early suttas, um, but it's it's still within that same area as in the early Buddhist area. It's not far from uh, Bodh Gaya uh, to, to, the, to, the, uh, uh, to the west and maybe a little bit south, I think uh, maybe 100 or 200 kilometers uh, compared to Rajagaha and Bodh Gaya. So, uh, so there is, you know, there's not much evidence, but what there is does definitely point back to the idea of the Buddha as a as an actual person, as a living historical memory in that time and that place. Yeah? Uh, so these are these, as I mentioned at the beginning, these these the things that we can know directly, right? So there's there's a few bits and pieces that we know directly, and from there we have to rely on inference, right? So so. Fortunately, we have the, the suttas and the vinaya, and even though uh, you know, we can't uh, prove that those things all come from the time of the Buddha, but what's very uh, obvious is that the, the picture of the time and the place that they paint is very much the same as what the archaeological record is showing. That is to say, the culture which covered that same area. We have a similar level of, of the, the language and the depiction of the culture and so on and so forth. And so it's, it's very much sort of based in that time, in that place, in that period, and couldn't really take place in any other time in Indian history. Yeah? Again, remembering this, that, that things change. So, you know, to think about our own culture, right? You know, if, you, if you were to read somebody writing a story, and they might write a, a, a story about uh, somebody who went for a holiday and was walking down the beach or something like that, and then they used their iPhone to tweet a message, right? Now, immediately you would know within a few years when that story was set, okay? And if somebody said, and this story was set in the 1950s, you'd say, hang on, right? No, 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 it's a genuine story, but maybe they had iPhones in those days, but we just didn't know about it, right? <laughs> right? And you think, well, of course, it's ridiculous, right? And it's the same if you know the history, then you know, hang on, 
you know, there, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a certain sequence to the development of these technologies, right? And there's a certain, uh, there's an, there's, you can see the gradual growth and the urbanization, the development of culture, the, the evolution of the rules of governance and kingship, the, the expansion of the kingdoms, the expansion of the trade routes, uh, the knowledge of lands outside of that area and so on. And, and so for if this is one of the reasons why uh, uh, Venerable Brahmali and myself have, have uh, written a book in recent the last year about the authenticity of the Buddhist scriptures. And one of the main arguments that we've used and we've developed is, is that, that, the, that the suttas, you know, you have millions of words in the suttas and the vinaya, which is located in that time and that place, right? And nowhere does it mention iPhones, okay? <laughs> right? Not to mention iPhones, nowhere does it mention, say, things like writing, okay? So even, even there's one or two mentions of writing in the Pali Canon, which are probably in some of the later portions of it. You know, there's, no, there's no mention of, um, for example, a, 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 a kingship or a country which extended across the whole of India, okay? And this is something which, which actually was the, the political reality in India a few decades after the Buddha died. And yet the, the political situation in the time of the Buddha is always represented as these, these multiple different countries, these small little, little kingships. Yeah? Sorry? Like councils, like kind of local, local states, local kingships. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like a more feudal kind of um, environment. Yeah. And you, you know, you can see, you can see the the scale of things that's imagined in the time of the Buddha. For example, there's a there's a, a sutta on the cart right, okay, and where 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 the king is is felt to have gone to the to the uh, uh, it was going to there was going to be a war or something like that. So the king needed a new chariot, right? So he went to the cartwright to say, "Build me a new chariot." Right? So he's giving you a sense of the scale of things, right? You know, you can imagine the prime minister of Australia thinking, "Oh, we're going to have a war soon. We'd better get a tank. I've, I've got to go down to the local mechanics and get them to make me a tank." Right? You know, you can see things are being imagined on a very small scale. King Ashoka didn't do that, right? King Ashoka had a, a city with a million people in it and and armies with thousands of elephants and stuff like that. So. Uh, you can imagine a situation where a king would personally go to the chariot to, to the carpenter to prepare his chariot for the war. Yeah? So it's a very, everything's happening at a very small scale. Anyway, so when we when we when we look at that history, we 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 get more of a sense for uh, who the Buddha was, what he was teaching in that time and that place. Yeah, uh, and to come up, come back to that that teaching on rebirth that I mentioned before, and that being one of the major issues that people bring up again and again. You, know, you can see that the, 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 within the Brahmanical tradition, okay, there was no sort of fixed or very solid idea about rebirth at that time. Okay? The Vedas don't give anything particularly clear about rebirth. The Upanishads give a lot of different accounts, several different accounts about what happens when you die and what happens to the Atman after death and these kinds of things. Right? There's no, there's no like, fixed, clear view about what rebirth is, as you find in later Hinduism. Similarly, within the Shramana traditions, certain of them accepted the idea of rebirth, like Jainism, for example. Others rejected it and said, no, after you, when you die, your body just goes back to the four elements and nothing exists after death. So it was quite possible for people to teach these things. And the ideas were current in the in the in the culture. The Buddha knew about them. It talked about quite clearly and explicitly and openly in the suttas. So the idea that uh, uh, the Buddha was somehow forced to teach about rebirth because that's what his cultural expectations were, and he couldn't teach anything else, is is completely absurd. You and I are quite capable of understanding what our culture teaches reflecting on it and deciding for ourselves whether we agree with it, right? Not to speak of you and I, any 15-year-old school child is capable of doing that, right? And any of you who've got children will know that that's the case, right? That, that sometimes your children will agree with things that you tell them or what your culture tells them and sometimes they'll disagree. And so to say that, to say that the Buddha was unable to do that is to say that the Buddha had less intelligence and reflective capacity than a 15-year-old school child. Yeah? But this is what people say. Anyway, so 
the Buddha taught about rebirth because that was what his experience was. That was what his understanding was. That was what the, the reality that he perceived. So uh, that was what he based that teaching on. Uh, so this is this is just one example, but it's it's an example of how we can see uh, by studying and by understanding a little bit better uh, the history, the time, the place, the culture that the Buddha lived in, that we can put the Buddha's teachings in a context that has meaning within that culture. And then once we've done that, we can then start to ask those questions about, well, how does that apply for us now? How, how, what does that mean for our culture? How should we present the Dhamma here? How should we practice the Dhamma in our own lives? Um, because just as the Buddha, everything the Buddha said always begins with a time and place, right? Every sutta. Yeah? One time, the Buddha was staying in Savati. Yeah? There's a time and there's a place. Everything has a time and place. It has a historical context. And that's every time you sit and meditate, you sit and meditate at a time and a place. <laughs> every time your mind becomes overwhelmed with anger, it becomes overwhelmed with anger at a time and a place. Yeah? And there are certain reasons for that. There's, a, there's conditions, there's a culture, there's a context, there's a background. And so we can only understand these things when we begin to understand the background. Okay, so that's probably talking for enough this evening. So I offer that for your reflection and I'd like to invite any comments or questions.